Hello to the world and to the kingdom citizens. I greet you in the precious holy name of Yeshua Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach, who said in his word, John 8 and 32, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Hi, I'm Dr. John Curry, ambassador, Pan-African, and welcome to the embassy of the kingdom of heaven on earth. If you want to follow this podcast, please subscribe to JC Global, MSC TV One, ring the bell, and hit the thumbs up button. Today I have a message for you, and I believe most of us who are Africans who happen to live in America understand that integration never did work for us. Even Dr. Martin Luther King said that he believed that he led his people into a burning house of integration. And today, we're still dealing with ghettos, barrios, and silos. I want you to take a peek at this clip because I think it explains why we're still being mistreated the way we are when it comes to urban development and come to building our own black communities. Yes, I told you in the previous clip, it is time for us as a people to heal and build. Hope you enjoy this clip. Like many songs will tell you. The story of what housing and other living conditions look like for many Black Americans is pretty bleak. And that's by design. In addition to artists cataloging their very personal experiences, it's been proven that the modern phenomenon of concentrated Black poverty was an intentional government-sponsored institution. This is in part why President Biden issued an executive order back in January intended to right the historical wrongs Black folks have faced when it comes to housing and home ownership in this country. But first, let's take it back. The dawn of the 20th century, African Americans in major cities lived scattered throughout the city. They weren't segregated particularly. It's only with the great migration of the six to seven million African Americans north and west escaping the south. The predominant response of the United States government and state and local governments to the great migration was to contain black people in their own neighborhoods. And HUD, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, was particularly a part of this role. But the precursors to HUD introduced and encouraged racially restrictive covenants, redlining of every major city where African Americans landed. The federal government was a sponsor of urban renewal, infamously called Negro removal by the great James Baldwin. Urban renewal, which means moving the Negroes out. Get it? it means Negro removal. That is what it means. And the federal government is, a, is, is, is an accomplice to this fact. That so-called urban renewal also included a federally sponsored interstate highway system, which was intentionally designed to mow through vibrant Black neighborhoods. Take Miami, for example. Two highways, I-95 and I-395, bulldoze right through the predominantly Black and low-income Overtown neighborhood previously called Colored Town during segregation. The Department of Housing and Urban Development and the federal government writ large in the first seven decades of the 20th century invested billions of dollars in racial segregation and concentrated poverty. Each time this country created a peculiar institution that subordinated Black people, slavery, Jim Crow, it created and dismantled it, they replaced it with another one. And the iconic Black ghetto, I don't use that as a purgative, I use it as a descriptor, was a follow-on institution to slavery and Jim Crow. That's the legacy that every new administration inherits, and the Biden administration has as well. Today, I'm directing the Department of Housing and Urban Affairs and Urban Development to redress the historical racism in federal housing policies. This executive order is just one of four signed by President Biden designed to address racial equity in the United States. And while this progress is a step in the right direction, there's still a lot of harm to undo. 
segregation started coming down after the passage of the Fair Housing Act of 1968, which actually only got passed in the wake of Dr. Martin Luther King's assassination. In 1980, eight out of 10 black people would have had to move in order to be evenly integrated within metropolitan areas. Half of black people who live in metropolitan areas still live in neighborhoods of high segregation. So we've had modest improvement, but segregation persists and economic segregation has spiked since 1970. The so-called American dream is only working for a relatively small slice of the population that can afford to buy their way into what I call gold standard neighborhoods that have the best of everything. And everybody else struggles and the black poor struggle the most. So what happens now? Well, some advocates are hopeful. Holm applauds this executive order for really focusing on historical patterns of racial segregation and discrimination in housing. While others remain cautiously optimistic. Here's Professor Cashin's suggestion. I don't take credit for this, but I applaud it. There should be an equity analysis. The federal government spends so much money it should track who's getting it by neighborhood and it should pursue racial equity in the distribution of resources. There's been a lot of movement at the local level on this. Off of the example of Baltimore, they did an equity analysis and found that they were spending four times as much money in majority white neighborhoods as the majority black ones. I think we're in this moment where people are waking up, sad to say, because of the slow execution of George Floyd, to the realities of systemic racism. And I believe there is an ascending majority multiracial coalition that wants something better than a separate unequal nation that overinvests in some neighborhoods and disinvests and preys upon people in other neighborhoods. I'm hopeful. But you can never stop working for and organizing for the country you want. New generations more radical and less tired than me. There's always another generation coming. The problem is too much melanin with the recessive gene.